Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. What would you say is your interesting writing quirk? Do you have a, is there any like quirks that to kind of get you into the, the writing frame of mind? Um, like I have to be at a certain desk or I have to, you know, it has to be between this. Is there a certain time of day where you have to, yeah, that's a good question. What would your um, wife say? What would your wife say would be your quirks when it comes to your writing? I think I like to kind of hide when I write. I, I, My son is the opposite. If my son has you know schoolwork to do or he's writing a paper, he wants to be in a coffee shop with a bunch of noise around him. And I just, I don't work that way. There are times where I can do that. I might have music on at times, but usually I want to have a quiet place without interruptions. And for me, I guess my quirk is that I take an awful long time to get started. I almost have to, I have to write the first paragraph or two and it has to be exactly right. And then I can write the rest. I I know some people kind of lay things down or they'll just kind of type and type and type. They'll just write and write and write. And then they'll kind of piece it together later on or they'll refine it. And I'm not that way. I just, I I, kind of have to, it's almost a hill of my own making. I have to get over the first hill. And then once I've done that, then I can, I can write more freely. Did you ever experience writer's block? Yeah. um, How long did that last? Um, a couple of days. Um, and again, it helps not to be on a deadline. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I hate wasting time, but there, there are some days I I can't just stare at a blank screen. I mean, you know, used to be you'd stare at a blank piece of paper, but now I'm writing on a computer. So if I can't think of something for a while, then I'll go do some research or I'll you know, read the Bible or I'll do something else just to kind of get things going. But I don't want to get super frustrated, but I also don't want to walk away. So I, I do want to get something down on paper. So if I'm having writer's block on one thing, then because I'm doing a devotional, maybe I can jump to a different topic and, and accomplish something there. That's why I don't know how my daughter writes novels. Cause if I, if I was writing a novel and I had writer's block, I don't know what I would do. I mean, you know, if you're stuck, I, I don't, I don't know how she gets, but she apparently never has it because she writes a whole novel in a couple of weeks. So I, I just, I, I envision some, I envision sparks coming off the keys when she's writing. Cause she's just writing so fast. It's just unbelievable. That's amazing. That's amazing. Does she help you at all? Has she helped you at all in any of these books? She did. Yeah. She helped me a lot, especially with the first one. Um, she wrote all the prayers in the first one. <laughs> <laughs> because I joke that I, I can't write prayers. You know, I spent, I take all this energy and put it in the devotion and I make sure that I get the, you know, the Bible passages that I want. And I'm real, I'm real happy with it. And I, I spend time on the questions and then I've got to write a prayer and it's like, Oh, I can't write the prayer. I, I you know, nothing's coming to mind. So I guess I have writer's block on prayers. So she did, <laughs> she did all of those for the first one. They're um, real nice then, too. They're just, they're simple. Yeah. They're like yeah, two real, sentence prayers. Yep. But they're, which they're, is what I wanted. I mean, I, it's kind of, I gave her some guidance and I said, you know, well, for space reasons as well as just for, I like, I like short to the point prayers. I I'm, I'm not a flowery prayer. Um, and, um, the other thing she helped me with was, um, even though she was in college at the time, she's become a real expert on the publishing industry. And she had a lot of contacts in the publishing industry and knew, how you submit things to publishers for them to consider it. So um, I don't remember if she connected me to the publisher that I ended up getting, but she certainly helped me get some good proposals out there and feel more confident that I might get it published. It's interesting because you do have two different, you, you have, so as of this interview, 
you have published two books. Right. Okay. You've published two books, two different publishers, right? Right. Right. And explain to people why two different publishers. Because I would think once you're hooked in with one, that they would just gra- grab your, you know. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that happens for some people. <laughs> um, <laughs> publishing is it's a very getting a book published is very, very difficult. Now, that being said, you can self publish a book and it's very, very easy. Um, and, um, it doesn't cost you anything. I mean, there are, there's different ways to publish. You can self publish with, uh, they're called hybrid publishers and they might charge you a flat fee to give you marketing and to give you editing, give you other services. But you can go on the Kindle system, the Amazon system, and you can publish your book literally for free. Um, you can design your own cover. You can lay your book out and it will be available on Amazon worldwide and it costs you nothing. And you get and you get revenue from it. If you sell a book, you get a percentage. I think it's less than 30%, but it's not bad. But the downside of self-publishing is that Typically, a self-published author will sell maybe a couple hundred copies of a book. Mm. And if your goal is to have a bigger reach than that, and you ever go to a traditional publisher after having self-published, they pretty much won't talk to you because they'll say, well, have you written any other books? And you say, oh, yeah, I've written three. How'd they do? Well, I sold, you know, 200 copies of each. And they say, well, you know, we're not interested. So in my case, I was... I was extremely fortunate to get Broad Street as my publisher. There are people who work for publishers called, um, uh, I think it's development. Their job is development. Um, That may be wrong. It may be the wrong term, but they basically are, they're on on the prowl. They're scouting for potential books that the publisher might publish. And um, the guy who was in that role at Broad Street in late 2017, he saw my proposal and he liked it and he gave me a shot. And that happens very, very rarely. Um, so I was very blessed to have that with Broad Street. But I thought the same thing you thought when, when the book um, started selling well. Because the book, thought, the, that book, that book has, let's talk about it. That book has sold well over 150,000 copies, right? Yeah, it's it's two hundred fifty thousand now. Yeah, it's, it's two hundred fifty million. Of that copies. one book of that one book. Yeah, okay. it's just now, been unbelievable. I have heard that ninety percent, or there's some crazy statistic like ninety percent of all books published never sell more than five thousand copies. Is that the right. statistic? Yeah, does that yeah, sound that's, right? That's what I've heard. Yeah, ninety <laughs> percent never sell more than five thousand. Yeah. This book has sold two hundred fifty thousand. So why aren't they just like? Did you try to, did you try to publish your second book with them? I went with, I, well, I didn't, I didn't have a proposal for them per se, but I, I went to them a couple of years after the book was published. And I said, look, the book's doing really well. Um, Would you like, would you like me to do another one? I could do more daily strength for men or, you know, I could, we could play off the title. And they said, no. <laughs> and um, I was kind of taken aback and I, I think I followed up at some point, but I never really got a good answer as to why. Now I have my suspicions and my suspicion is that um, the publisher does a lot of devotionals and they all, they have a terrific team. So the, you know, they all, the books all look great. The, the, um, the inside outside terrific quality, um, and they sell a lot of books on they've got that the niche inspirational because, racks. They've got that niche, right? Because yep, I mean, they've I've, got I've the niche, them, right? I've I've seen them in the stores. You know, they have those racks. Yep. Yep. And if and a lot of times I'm pulled over to those racks because of the covers, because yep. of the because you can tell they they're they're just set apart a little bit. Yep. They they I don't I haven't studied it, but I have to believe that Broad Street does very very well in that niche because. A lot of the books on the choice books, inspirational reading racks are from Broad Street. They look great. They're very high quality. 
as an author, I think that my book is popular because it's got good content. And I think that plays into it. But I think, like I said earlier, you can't dispute that the the beautiful quality of the book certainly helps with the sales. And I think it helps with people's impression. I mean, you know, you can get an ebook of anything these days, but when you have a nice leather bound book with, you know, beautiful quality, it just seems better, you know, for, for me, at least I'd rather have that kind of a book. So I think that Broad Street basically can do that type of business without my help is the bottom line. I mean, the book's done great. I'm sure Broad Street's very happy, but I think that Broad Street probably figured, well, we can do other books in this genre that will do pretty well too. And we don't need, we don't need the hassles of working with Chris. <laughs> Cause like well, they, I said, I mean, I, I was a complete moron when we came, you know, so I, I think it, we came pretty close to missing the deadline when, when it came down to it, because I was furiously rewriting devotions and trying to get stuff to fit. And I think that's, that's gotta be draining on a publisher to have to deal with a, an author who doesn't really know what he's doing. Um, that's amazing. So I found, I found Crosslink. Um, Crosslink is a small publisher actually out of South Dakota. And um, again, was blessed to get a contract with them for 50, 52 weeks. Um, but that particular book doesn't have a leather cover. And so you're probably not going to find it on the choice books rack. You know, you, you're probably, you're more likely to order that one online. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might find it in a Christian bookstore, but let's face it, how many Christian bookstores are there these days? You know, they're not on every corner, you know, there's a couple in Northeast Ohio. There's a couple in Southwest Florida, but there's just not as many as there used to be. Right. So most people buy their books online. And these days, a lot of people are going with, um, with eBooks just because but they're the cheaper thing that, and they're, and they're easier. The thing that you got going for you on, on this, on this book though, is, is the forward is by Kyle Eidelman. Yeah. That, I mean, I mean, he's, he's very well known. So yeah, that, and you got it right on the front there. I mean, um, is this, is this book doing okay? It's doing okay. Uh, it's just, I've been so spoiled by, by the daily strength for men that, you know, I don't know if any book I could write could, could I'll even come close one. to how that one's done. Um, Which that brings me to a question, Chris, what do you consider literary, literary success to look like? Like what, what do you, what do you want? What do you, you know, you've put these out here. What, what does success look like for you? I have to remind myself that that's a question where I really need to think about what God wants for this. Um, and I say that because, you know, the sales have been great. I get a royalty, not a huge one, but I get a royalty on every book. So, you know, that's, that's great for me, but it's the, it's the emails that I get. It's the, it's the people I talk to occasionally um, who say, this book had a big impact on me. Um, I got one a week or two ago from a guy who really liked the book, like Daily Strength for Men. He had written me before and told me how, how much he enjoyed it, how, how much it had helped him in his walk with Christ. And I was emailing people that had purchased books just to let them know about 52 weeks and, you know, um, contact me if they had any questions. And he wrote me back and he said that um, he's friends with a guy who's not a Christian. And I think that they do bicycling together. They do some activity together. And he's always been trying to approach this guy to talk to him about Jesus and just didn't, didn't know, you know, was, wasn't sure how to do it. And he said the Holy Spirit was prompting him to give this guy my book. So he did. And still, that took some courage. I mean, he didn't know how the guy would react because they really haven't talked about anything spiritual. And he said the guy really likes the book. And now he can talk to this guy about spiritual stuff. And it's, you know, it's it's broken the ice. And to me, that's just that's success, right? I mean, that's that's success in in eternal terms, right? And at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter how many people buy my book. I get one of those stories, right? And it something I've done, God's, God's used something I did to bless somebody else and potentially to help somebody 
evangelize a friend and bring him into the kingdom of God. So that's now I'll complain as much as the next person about how my book's not selling. You know, I mean, I'd love my book to sell well, but if I, right. If so I what I hear you saying is success, it, success has changed lives. And right. I feel, I feel the same way. I mean, that's part of the reason why I do this podcast is like, I'm just, you know, trusting that maybe something in the podcast is going to change somebody's life, you, yep. you know, um, bring them to faith or deepen their faith. Or, I mean, here, this is a really interesting interview because you're a guy that you never set out to be an author. Right. And um, basically, you know, this kind of calling kind of found you, you know, at, at a, at a really interesting time in your life. So one of my questions was going to be, do you hear from your readers much? And you just shared a story about hearing from one of your readers. So does that happen a lot? Um, not a lot. Um, I don't, and I don't blame people. I mean, I've, I don't think I've ever contacted an author except for Kyle Eidelman. And that's a long story that I won't tell, but I ended up getting to meet him, um, back in 2014, 2015. And he was gracious enough to agree to write the forward in my second book. Um, cause he's just a great guy. Um, but, uh, I do get contacted, I think more by people when I write an article. So I write, I write articles for crosswalk.com, which is a Salem online media publication. And I'm also writing for biblical leadership. I'm doing some devotions for them. Um, when I write on uh, a topic, um, you know, one of them I've written on is divorce. Um, I'll get guys contact emailing me. They see my contact information at, at the bottom of the article and they just share heartbreaking stories. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think I've gotten more emails on the topic of divorce than anything else I've written on uh, and any of my devotionals. Um, but to me, that's an indication that, like we said at the outset of the show, a lot of guys are lonely. They're they're going at life on their own, right? They don't have anybody they can confide in. Um, even if they're if they're Christians and they go through something tough, they don't perceive that they have somebody at their church or in their life that they can they can sit down with and confide in or ask for help. So they they contact somebody they've never met who wrote an article. I mean, they don't know me, yeah. but I mean, sometimes they contact me multiple times and, you know, they ask me what I think. And I'm always very careful not to give them advice. Um, I try to point them to the Bible. I try to point them to Christ. Um, so in some cases I, I say, you really should get a counselor or you should find somebody at your church to talk to your pastor. Um, but yeah, I think that, I think that men in general, are just struggling. They're, they're, they're going at life alone or with very few brothers around them. And we're just not, we're not supposed to do that. Yeah. Um, so I just have a couple more things and we'll wrap up. Um, okay. you have two books published. Do you ever read your book reviews? Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> what um, is that like for you? It's, 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 um, for the most part, it's again, you know, I, I'm not the most humble guy, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm really a nobody when it comes to the, you know, to writing books. So just to read a, a review where somebody says, wow, this book is great. You know, in some cases they'll say my son really likes it. My husband really likes it. It's, sometimes they get more personal. You know, this has really helped me. Those, those mean the world to me. But there are some funny ones. Um, I have one review on Amazon in the UK. <laughs> a guy, a guy bought like three or four copies for everybody in his family, and he hates it. <laughs> he says it's poor, poorly written. He gives it two stars out of five, and you know that's my only review in the UK. So apparently, it's not doing well in the UK. <laughs> and then I have, um, I have one guy that that reviewed it and said. Um, you know, I read somewhere that this is only Old Testament verses, and that's not true because what I do is the main verse for a, a devotion is the Old Testament, but then I'll bring in a New Testament passage to go along with the Old Testament passage. So he said, this is not just Old Testament, and he really liked the book. 
And then a different guy recently was complaining because he says the book has no New Testament passages, no gospel in it. Um, and so he gave it one star. So <laughs> it's feast or famine. I either get five stars from some, somebody who defends the book using the New Testament, or I get one star from somebody who says it doesn't have any New Testament. So you just have to laugh. I mean, you know. If you have somebody that's been reading Oswald Chambers, you know, every year for 20 years. Right. You know, uh, or or Charles Spurgeon or something. I mean, yeah, it, it's. Yeah, yeah. You, I'm glad. I'm glad that you take it that way. You just, um, yeah, yeah. You, you do. You just have to laugh because you never know. Um, I'm just know. hoping it. You know, my goal. I'm not the best writer on the planet. My goal is to first and foremost get people into their Bible, but secondly, get them to think. You know, get them to think, and then spark conversations. I mean, my wife and I did it together. With 52 weeks, I'm really hoping that groups of guys will do it. I, I kind of wrote it with the weekly format. I was kind of hoping, and I'm still hoping that groups of guys at a church or guys that, you know, go golfing together, or whatever, will just say, Hey, you know, we've been we've been talking about some stuff. Why don't we get this book and and have a, a weekly discussion about the topics that he provides? So if I if I can get people into their Bible and get them talking with each other and supporting and encouraging each other, then you know that's that's great. It do, doesn't really matter if it's if it's well written or not. I mean, I want it to be well written, but you know, if if I can get people walking more closely with Jesus, just a tiny bit, you know, then that's. I mean, you are connecting them to to the Bible, which is connecting them to the Lord. So. The right. daily strength for men is 365 days of devotionals. There's one for every day. I'm curious just about the format. What? May, why did you choose in the second one, the 52 weeks of strength for men? Why did you choose that weekly format? I did it for a couple of reasons. One, um, in daily strength, there are a lot of themes. Um and um, originally, I thought there might be an index in the book. So if you wanted to read about faith, then it would tell you, okay, well, here's the devotions on faith. If you wanted to read on hope or love or peace or anger or some other topic, it would give you a list. We, we couldn't do it. I mean, like I said, we were against the clock just to get the book out. So we, we couldn't have any additional things in there. I think a lot of guys like to read on topics. My my joke on devotionals is that, you know, it's it's kind of like Forrest Gump and a box of chocolates. You know, you never know what you're going to get. I mean, just because it's April 3rd, you have no idea what's going to be the devotion for April 3rd, what the verse is going to be. It's just no, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And so I thought with a weekly format, I still have seven passages for them to read, but it's all topical. And so I thought that guys, either as individuals or small groups of guys could say, Hey, you know, the first 13 weeks in this are about the nature of God. The second 13 weeks are on God in your day-to-day -day life. Then there's big topics and then there's tough topics. You can do it as a as a study with a couple a couple of buddies. And you know, you can do whatever you want. I mean, if you if you want to skip a topic, if you want to spend a couple of weeks on a topic, that's up to you. But that was really my goal is a little meatier on the devotion side. Um, there are two and a half pages per devotion instead of just one. Um, but really getting into some of these topics in a little more depth while not overloading guys with, you know, a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. So that was my, it was something, it was something new. One thing I try to do um, is do something different. You yeah. know, and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Like I, the the first one is all Old Testament. I I had not seen a devotional that was all Old Testament verses, so I thought, what the heck? Let's let's try it and see see how it does. And um, so the second one, I've seen a couple of fifty two week format books out there, but very few. So I thought, well, we'll give it a try and see if if people like. It. If they don't like it, then I'll do something different next time. Hmm. I like that. And you know, when you're <laughs> Uh, I think that's probably part, one of the keys to your success is that you're willing to try something different and willing to fail. I mean, you, 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 right. uh, 
when we knew each other and we were in CLC, you you really had a heart for small churches and you were really trying to come alongside and help them. And that project didn't work. It just that was an absolute failure. And you mentioned the song earlier on. And I, you know, I was an executive producer on the song, which is the best Christian movie that nobody ever saw. Um, you know, <laughs> fantastic what? movie, right? Is it is and it out there? Is it on YouTube? It, it, it came out. You can find it in a couple places. Um, it used to be on DVD, but fabulous movie. You know, I got to know the people, the creative team behind it, you know, producer, director, the writer, all wonderful people. And the movie just bombed. So, I, I, you know, after I retired from high tech, I went through this sequence of trying stuff. And this was probably, you know, God waiting for me to rely on him, you know, instead of on my own. But I, I, I tried the small church thing. I tried the investing in the movie. I tried investing in another project that was uh, multimedia based, all complete failures. But, you know, what year was the movie put out? 2014, 2014. I wonder, it seems like today's with the phantom, uh, the way they're doing some of these Christian movies and showing them. Yeah. I wonder if it would do better to in today's um, kind of atmosphere and how they're how they're you know promoting smaller films. Um, but There's you're saying it's options. out there. If if yeah. if you Google uh, the song, it's out there. You people can find it and see it. Yeah. I, I, what is I'd the, love what is the basic, see it. What is the two sentence it's, plot line? Uh, it's basically um, Solomon, King Solomon. Um, set in modern time as a singer so um his dad is david king who's a famous country singer um and then he's jedediah he's jed king but you know as you know jedediah is the other name for solomon and it's it's supposedly based on the song of solomon but it's really more based on ecclesiastes Mm. And it's a very, it's a very gritty movie. Uh, you know, it, it really, you know, he gets in, you know, shows his temptations. Um, and, but it's a very, you know, redeeming movie at the end. And I just thought it was such a clever script and so well done, but you know, that's, that's movies, you know, you'll have, you'll have a very well-written movie that does terribly. And then you'll have a movie that's in my opinion, not very good. And it makes, you know, a hundred million dollars. So Um, but you know, I, I learned a lot in that process. And, and like I said, I think it was more the case of God, (laughs) my relationship with God is, you know, God's very patient with me. Eventually God will, you know, take, take a, a bat and kind of hit me with the bat or nudge me with the bat to get me doing something. But for the most part, God waits until I wake up and, and decide to follow him and do what he wants me to do. So I appreciate the patience of God and just appreciate the opportunity to be writing these books and these articles and to be used by God, to have my written words used by God to to reach people. That's fantastic. Okay, two final thoughts. Um, One is, are you working on any future projects? And then how can people get in touch with you? Like if they are interested in learning more, uh, or uh, checking out your the books that you've got published, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Maybe start with that and then talk about it. Yeah. Um, I've got a website with a couple different URLs. Um, you can go to chrisbolinger.com if you can remember how to spell my name. But rather than telling you that, I would just go to mensdevotionals.com. It's the same website, just you know, redirects you to the website. So men's devotionals, no apostrophe, because you can't put that in a URL, but men's devotionals.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, um, Twitter, although I don't spend much time on Twitter because <laughs> Twitter is not my not my jam. Um and in terms of what I'm working on now, um I a book that I'd really like to write, and I'm not sure if I will do this this coming year. I'd like to. Um, I'm fascinated by the earliest Christians. Um, You know, I'm I'm finding more and more evidence that um, Christianity kind of exploded on the scene 
shortly after the resurrection of Jesus. And, you know, we talk about when were the New Testament books written and there's arguments about that. But these people very, very quickly understood who Jesus is, what his what he had done and what it meant for them. I mean, they started worshiping on Sundays, um, which we we talk we we take it for granted now, but it was such a dramatic change. And I just I'd like to write, maybe it'll be a devotional, maybe something else, but I, I'd really like to expose people to what the earliest Christians accomplished um, because it's just fascinating to me. My favorite book is Acts. It's always been Acts. I'm just fascinated by what these ordinary people did. You know, I mean, Jesus ascended and, you know, they're staring up at the sky, <laughs> you know, their, their leader, their leader ascended and, you know, and then Pentecost comes, but it's just, I think we underplay how extraordinary all of this was in just, you know, a handful of years. Um, I'm fascinated by Peter and what he did, Mark, Paul, obviously the other disciples, but just, I, I, I'll try to say it real quickly. Uh, I was researching Pilate because there's the one verse in, I think it's Matthew where Pilate's wife comes up to him and says, you know, have nothing to do with this man because I had a dream about him. And I, I started thinking, how did this verse end up in the Bible? You know, how, and the only conclusion I could come to was that Pilate's wife was a Christian because I think she told she I think it was commonly known that that had taken place because she had told people. And then I found out that both she and Pontius Pilate himself are um, have been are considered saints by some of the Orthodox churches. So they believe that Pontius Pilate actually became a Christian. And to me, that's just fascinating that, you know, the person who, when we say the creeds, we, you know, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. I mean, and the fact that I can't prove it, but it's possible that the man who sentenced Jesus to die ended up becoming a follower of his. So it's just, so that you can tell I'm excited about it. I don't know if, if this is a book that I can write. I don't know if I can get it published, but I, I think this is a story worth telling to people. So I'm going to try to find a way to do that. Best of luck in the in the future, Chris. And I Thanks, hope we can, we can stay in touch. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.